Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 265, The Higher Doctorate. There have been many lessons that we've shared through this doctoral series, but I think the most important lesson is the doctorate is diverse. The PhD improves by recognising the diversity of research modes and the diversity of research students. And we've spent a lot of time through this vlog series exploring the PhD by prior publication, the artefact and exegesis PhD, and indeed the professional doctorate. And what I think we've learned is that the more that traditional forces in our culture try and make the PhD one thing, so confusing standards and standardisation, making the doctorate one thing, the more ludicrous the doctorate appears in the contemporary changing social, cultural, economic environment. Because each of these innovations in doctoral education teach us something. They teach us about something about our universities, they teach us about our students, and they teach us about how to be better supervisors. So it seems appropriate to complete, if you will, this celebration of the diversity of the doctorate with indeed the Emperor Palpatine of the doctoral suite. Or indeed, those of you that are more into the light side of the force, yes it is, you know it's coming. The Yoda of doctoral education. Yeah. Now, that metaphor works on many levels as often it does when I summon the great Star Wars. And basically, if you've done a PhD, you've received your training as a Jedi. So you've completed your PhD, you have been trained young Jedi. So what is left to do at that point? Is there anything higher than a higher degree? And yes, young Skywalker, there is. The higher doctorate is rare and it's special. It is the marker of a career of excellence and achievement. So after two years work, we at Flinders University, we've just created our first higher doctorates. A lot of slog, a lot of effort, we're very proud of them. So it seems really significant, I think, to celebrate this moment at Flinders to talk about this very special, very rare addition to our doctoral suite. So the higher doctorate exists at Flinders University and exists in universities around the world. So let's start with what they are. What are we dealing with here? What is a higher doctorate? So the higher doctorate is awarded to people who, who have already gained a PhD of at least five years standing. So you have a PhD and then five years have passed and then you are available to enrol in a higher doctorate. So what is being assessed in your higher doctorate is the research produced since your PhD. The higher doctorate therefore is amazing in so many ways because it's a way to provide recognition to scholars who have made a contribution to knowledge in their field, a contribution to their discipline. So the higher doctorate is different from the PhD in many ways. You won't hear me mention the word originality. An original contribution to knowledge, that's the definition of a PhD. The higher doctorate assumes originality. We're moving on to different words. The higher doctorate recognises a coherent contribution to knowledge, a significant contribution to knowledge, and indeed a distinguished contribution to knowledge. So you can see the different language that we're deploying here. The higher doctorate has lots of different types. At Flinders University we have three. So we have the Doctor of Science, 
Doctor of Letters and Doctor of Laws, but around the world they do have a series of diversity and different titles. So there is a Doctor of Engineering, Doctor of Theology, Doctor of Music, and some universities have some even rarer titles. So we have the, do the Doctor of Agricultural Science, the Doctor of Veterinary Science. So as you can notice, most of you watching this vlog, you are enrolled in a Doctor of Philosophy. That's the title. And that Doctor of Philosophy is awarded to all disciplines, even outside of philosophy. So that is the title you are gaining, Doctor of Philosophy. But as you can pick up, the higher doctorate, the titling is located in particular disciplines. That's a really significant point here. So it is an international recognition of profile, esteem, excellence, but also expertise. So for our friends watching around the world, our current students watching around the world, thinking about the higher doctorate is important because it allows you to consider your research career after the PhD. And I think that's also pretty important in and of itself. Because when you think about the higher doctorate, it forces you to realize the PhD will end. <laughs> and you also need to consider research planning after that PhD has been completed. Because in so many ways, the PhD is not an ending. The PhD is a beginning. So the higher doctorate has two parts to it, two parts. The first part is a contextual statement. And the second part is the selection of the research outputs that have been created and constructed since the submission and dissemination of the PhD. So let's talk about the research outputs first. Let's talk about the second part. Okay. So what happens is students gather together all of their published work that have been produced after the graduation from a PhD and therefore just before the enrolment in a higher doctorate. So the period we're dealing with, and this can vary from five years, remember it's got to be five years after the PhD, to in my case, wow, nearly 25 years after a PhD has been submitted. So in the period between the PhD has been submitted and the higher doctorate is enrolled into that qualification, that's the period we're dealing with for the outputs. So in assessing the research career, the student must already hold a doctorate and they must demonstrate, important word, demonstrate through the subsequent research that they have configured a significant contribution to knowledge in their disciplines. Wow. Now, why I love the higher doctorate is it respects excellence in mediocre times. It respects excellence, but it respects excellence in disciplines and recognizes that there are a diversity of disciplines and excellence is different in each of those disciplines. Four words are used to punctuate, if you will, this discussion of significance and excellence. And these words are impact and engagement, influence and esteem. Really great, really important words. You can actually use them for punctuation for the entirety of your research planning and research career if you choose. Now you're going to hear those four words a lot in this vlog because you need to prove, you need to prove rather than assume that you have advanced knowledge. It recognises that the knowledge that you're advancing may be within a university but it also may be outside of a university with stakeholder communities. That works too. The higher doctorate is therefore a showcase, a showcase for a profound researcher who's made a profound contribution. So in this case, you don't have a program of study, if I use that old fashioned phrase, you don't have a program of study here. You've already done the work. So you simply therefore require the contextual statement to make the case. Now, you have a supervisor in the higher doctorate, you have one supervisor, but they're not the supervisor like they would be in a PhD. It's a very different supervisor. 
because what the supervisor of a higher doctorate is doing is helping the student present themselves at their very best. So what the supervisor is doing is firstly helping the higher doctoral candidate make the best cut, the best selection of publications and then helping them configure the contextual statement to make the best case for three examiners to assess this portfolio of a career and research life. So if you will, the supervisor in a higher doctorate is a peer. They are a friend, but most precisely I think the best phrase to describe a supervisor of a higher doctorate is a phrase I rarely use and that is the critical friend. You really are a critical friend helping this person alongside you represent themselves at their best. So if you will, the higher doctoral student already has all the bricks and all the mortar. They've got everything. They've got the bricks, they've got the mortar, they're ready to go. And the supervisor, the critical friend, helps the student get the bricks, get the mortar and construct the strongest wall they both can achieve. Therefore, for the supervisors that are watching this vlog, and also for all students who one day may end up supervising a higher doctorate, it is important to remember, I think, that all supervision is a privilege. All supervision is a privilege. But supervising a higher doctorate, you're not only contributing something enormous to somebody's life, you're actually contributing something enormous to your discipline. You're paying back. So we have a very specific role here, and I think Critical Friend best answers that role. Now, if you think about it, all of us have an academic career. So at this point, I'm at 20 scholarly monographs, 20 books, well over 200, I haven't done the count in a while, well over 200 refereed articles and book chapters and everything else, all the other born digital objects as well. And so what a critical friend would help me do is look at that CV, look at all those research outputs, and make the selection that creates the best case for the examiners. And that's, that's a complicated job. Now, as you can see, none of this is about quality because the research has already been refereed. It's already gone through quality assurance protocols. So we're not having a quality discussion, but it is about configuring a selection of quality work to make the case that shows the influence in our field and how we have changed, how we have transformed our research disciplines. So it's big, isn't it? This is fabulous. So students enroll anywhere between six months to a year. So it's a reasonably quick gig to do. And the student and the critical friend have two jobs. Select the research outputs to make the case and write the contextual statement. Okay, and by the way, once these two jobs are done, you can submit. So when we say six months, if you know what's going on and you're working well with your critical friend, once those two jobs are done, you can submit. And I think it is also important to know that a lot of colleagues out there who may be watching this vlog, you've been thinking about doing a higher doctorate, not for a couple of months, but for a couple of decades. A lot of people, including myself, um, has thought about this for a long time. So in our head, we've already got the shape of what we think this thing is going to look like. And so once the critical friend helps them solidify that case, you're in pretty quickly. So let's talk about how we showcase your career and particularly show how we demonstrate your contribution to a discipline. That's quite hard to do. So how do you select the books, the book chapters, the articles, the refereed conference proceedings and so forth? Now firstly, and this is the hard bit of the conversation, the number of publications that you submit very widely. <laughs> uh, the, the quantity, the scope and scale of publications that are presented in the higher doctorate it's pretty wide and so therefore it's quite challenging for me to present a number because people often say well how many do you need and look I will give you a number but I will also share the risk with that number so what's happening is you are presenting a lifetime of scholarship that's what you're doing and you're showcasing your contribution to the field therefore in this context less is not more 
Less is not more. In a higher doctorate, more is more because more is more, because more material allows you to present a more convincing case. So how do we select the publications? Well, firstly, the first way we cut away some articles and publications is it must not have been submitted in your PhD, or indeed as the trailing publications from your PhD. So all that work has already been submitted for a degree. So the first thing you need to do is draw a line under your PhD and trailing disseminations. Boom, that's gone. We're assuming that works in place and it starts from the post PhD experience. So the higher doctorate uses the PhD as a springboard, but what we're assessing is what you've done since the PhD. So, okay, there we go. That's the first way. Anything linked with the PhD, that's gone. Okay, then to scope and scale. Now, this is the really, really hard part to advise. So, you're brilliant people, I'm going to make the case and you can make your own mind up. The absolute minimum, and I mean absolute minimum, and I have seen this submitted for a successful higher doctorate, but the absolute minimum is six refereed articles. Now, Remember, the higher doctorate is looking for a sustained contribution. So one nature paper, no matter how magnificent that nature paper is, is not a sustained contribution. But remember that university life and research outputs come in many forms. So to give you an example, if I was constructing my higher doctorate, which I am considering doing, by the way, so I'm doing my master's degree at the moment, and probably then the next thing I will do is a higher doctorate. So this is personally of relevance to me as well. So if I was doing my cut for my higher doctorate, I'd look at the 20 books and I'd cut in 12. So 12 are the spine of the argument. I'd then look at the refereed articles. Probably 50 of those align to the spine of the books, and then I'd have sort of explanatory footnotes around some of the book chapters, maybe some of the journalism, the podcast, the born digital objects would be footnotes through the story. Now in my field, and I have a lot of fields, but in my field, the higher doctorate is dominated by books, single authored scholarly monographs, because they are the gold standard in my field. But that's obviously discipline specific. But it does make the point, I think, that you need to show excellence and your contribution and leadership in your research career. So remember, six articles are what most of us produce in a year. <laughs> so you may need more data points to demonstrate your expertise and your contribution. And when you are making your selection, do look at the entirety of your research career. So you're looking, if you will, this might help you, you're looking for pivots. You're looking for that key remarkable article that moved knowledge a little bit, like a compass point, moved it along, right? So you're looking for the pivots in your CV. What created movement? Movement for you professionally and movement for your discipline. So the selection of the publications, therefore, I would argue, should be through time. Remember, we're not assessing your original contribution to knowledge. That's what a PhD is. We're assessing your contribution to the discipline since the PhD. So as you can see, the best cases are often made through time. It's not simply a matter of going, here are the last 10 refereed articles I produced, bang, cut that off, submit it for a higher doctorate. It's dif differently constituted. So if you will, the publications must be like a breadcrumbed trail from your PhD to your career in the present. So from selecting the publications, the priority then is to create the narrative, create the arc of development, the arc of contribution. The best higher doctorates, therefore, have publications throughout the career and they build and they build and they build. The other key variable to consider, and this is really important, oh uh, yes, is the question of authorship. The examiners, and there are three of them, 
the examiners must be able to guarantee that this is your work. Therefore, it is important that the prospective candidate comes in and they are the sole author, the first author, or the corresponding author of enough of the publications to make the case. Now, this is crucial because the examiner will need to see that this is your work. It's your research that's being assessed, not somebody else. It's your research. It's your name on the degree. So therefore, you in the contextual statement will need to explain in great detail the scope and the scale of your contribution to research design, data collection, data analysis, interpretation, writing, editing and drafting. You will need to nail that down. You will need to confirm that. Now in some disciplines, this is really easy. You're the sole author, you did it, ta thanks, out. But if you are basing your higher doctorate on co-authored research, which is a large number of disciplines, I'm aware of that, then you're going to need to show your role. You're going to need to confirm your role in that publication that's being assessed for your contribution. Okay, so let's go into this incredibly important part of the higher doctorate. You will pass and fail on the basis of this, and that is the contextual statement. So the contextual statement commences the higher doctorate. So you open the document up and there is the contextual statement. So it becomes the lens and the frame for all the publications that are going to be evaluated. So the success and the failure of the higher doctorate is determined here. So the contextual statement has a particular role in the framing of publications. So the relationship between the publications must be written, must be confirmed. The development of research in your disciplines through these publications must also be confirmed. So here are the publications. Here's how they work together. Here's how they operate in my discipline. Secondly, the contextual statement has to confirm authorship your role in the research. Thirdly, and this is really crucial, you need to explain to the examiner your influence, your impact, your engagement and your esteem. These four crucial words. And those four words connect these publications with the international scholarly community. So when I'm helping people write these contextual statements, I ask them a key question. What do we know now that we didn't know before these publications were published? What do we know now that we didn't know before these publications were published? So that'll help you make the case. What do we know now? So to make that case, Metrics absolutely can be used, that's fantastic, but also more qualitative measures can also be deployed. Let me explain. So absolutely, you can go into Google Scholar, pick up the citations, knock yourself out. That's brilliant. But for example, you can also use book reviews to demonstrate the role of your books in the discipline. And remember, think about influence, impact, engagement, esteem. Each of these words are different and operate differently in different disciplines. So we could be dealing with, let's just give, me, give you a few examples of what we could be talking about. We could be talking about book awards. We could be talking about best papers at conferences. We could be talking about keynote addresses, recognition through a disciplinary society or organisation, or indeed the use of your research in a professional organisation, right? We could use altmetrics. We could be looking at media impact. We could be looking at patents. You can see the diversity of what we're talking about here. So find strategies to show how scholarly debates have been shaped through your research. So as you can see, this contextual statement can be long, and I would argue should be long. It should be long because the success of the entire higher doctorate is reliant on it. Hashtag no pressure. So when people ask me, again, how long should it be? How long should it be? And I sort of want to sort of summon a bit of Yoda, but also sort of go, well, how long's a piece of string, right? We have a parameter 
by which length is managed for the contextual statement. But you can see how broad this is. It starts at 10,000 words and goes up to, yes, 40,000 words. Because remember, this is crucial, you can't assume that the examiner agrees with you. Okay? You have to make the case for your research rather than assume the case. So start with you. Start with your career. Look at your publications. Look at where you were the sole, the first, or the corresponding author and verify that role and then start to cluster those publications into a meaningful narrative, into a meaningful arc. And finally, consider how you're going to make that case through influence, impact, engagement and esteem. So this is the higher doctorate. It's special. Wow. And it's specialist. This may seem a really long way from where you are now, enrolled in a PhD, but it's really not because one day, yes, you might complete a higher doctorate. One day you may supervise a higher doctorate. But the reason I wanted to complete a, a vlog on the higher doctorate is because the skills we've talked about today are actually the skills you need to move out of your PhD and into the next stage of your research career, your professional life. So this is so valuable. You've got to keep on situating yourself, situating your research in the disciplines around you. And by doing that endlessly, it's not just going me, 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 situating yourself. That keeps you contextually aware. So to this day, actually, I have four Word documents, and I've had those for, wow, about 25 years, that are impact, engagement, esteem, and excellence. And when something happens in my career, and you know, I add it to the CV, I always just take one more second and I put it in the esteem folder, or I put it in the impact folder. So that's been useful to me. So the Doctor of Philosophy is a truly brilliant qualification. The PhD is something spectacular. It is extraordinary. And for a very few of us, the higher doctorate gives our post-PhD career shape and meaning. I wish you love, light and peace. Tia.